Good morning. As Dave mentioned before, him and myself, Pam, will be wor your worship leaders today. Well, finally, June is busting out all over. Da -da 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 -da. That's the only line I remember from a play I was in when I started my career as a teacher in Brooks. It was Carousel, the musical Carousel. But every June, those words pop into my head when I see my apple trees and my flowering bushes burst forth with blossoms. I remember the last time I was worship leader speaking about the word wonder as being my chosen word for the year. Well, if some of my winter days did not seem as wondrous, spring always instills in me a sense of excitement and hope and new beginnings. This morning, we have an extremely exciting celebration to hear about, and hopefully to come away with a new aspect to it. So as a call to worship, I would like to invite the congregation to read with me responsive reading, number 735 at the back of the hymnal, or on the screen, and then I would like to invite the children up front to help us get started with our celebration. Transforming God, you come to us in expected and unexpected ways, desiring to be known, yet remaining a mystery. Make your presence known among us. Confront us. Wrestle with us. Change us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So if the children could come forward, if I have a story for you. Good morning. Okay, we're going to start off, first of all, playing a little game that years ago we used to call hangman, but that's not politically correct anymore, so I'm going to call it hang daisy. You know how to play this. Give me a letter. A. No, there's no A. No A. First part of Any other? B? No. Yeah. Pardon? Are you trying to speed the service along? <laughs> R? No. What's the word? Pentecost. <laughs> so what is Pentecost? Can you tell me what Pentecost means? You forget. You know what? I loved Pentecost when I was a teacher. You know why I loved it? We got a holiday at John Davidson. Do you get a holiday at St. Joe's for Pentecost? Did you have a day off for Pentecost? Probably. <laughs> we would get a holiday for Ascension Day and for Pentecost. But when I would ask my students why they were getting the day off, they would say, I don't know. 
And I'd say, well, are you going to church tomorrow? And quite often they'd say, no, we're going to Walmart. So when I got to be the Bible teacher, I thought, you know what? We need to talk about what Pentecost means. So I had to do a little research. And Pentecost was actually a celebration that the Jewish people celebrated. It was sort of like our Thanksgiving. They used to celebrate two Thanksgivings. They had one before the harvest and one after the harvest. So all the Jewish men would have to make the trip to Jerusalem, sometimes on foot, sometimes donkey, if they were wealthier, or maybe on camel, and they would have to celebrate this harvest. And it was a harvest of wheat. And the high priest would give present two loaves of freshly baked wheat bread to God to say thank you and to, and to ask him to be with them at the harvest. Well, the one day that the disciples, this is after Jesus had died and risen again. Do you know how many days it was after that? You're pretty close. Add six more to that. 44 and 6. Here, count. I'll do it again. It was 50 days, and the disciples were in Jerusalem. And imagine, it had only been 50 days since Jesus had died on the cross, had seen their teacher physically die on the cross, and then he rose again. And so they were still feeling, they are kind of mourning still. They were feeling pretty sad, but they were at this special Jewish festival, and suddenly this huge, huge wind came into the, where they were sitting, where they were meeting. Now, we're from southern Alberta. We know wind. So I'm going to ask everybody here, just to imagine that you're sitting in the room with the disciples, and it's windy. And I want you to really blow. We want to make it sound windy in here, OK? So that's everybody, not just you three, everybody. One, two, three. <laughs> oh, that's kind of pathetic. We're from southern Alberta. Come on, you guys. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> it was so windy. I'm sure the windows were were rattling and people probably, the disciples were looking at each other and they were probably like, what is going on? And they were probably jumping up and closing the shutters and, 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 and closing doors and thinking, what is going on? When suddenly something really wild happened. Now, I don't know if this is going to work. There were flames. It, the Bible says it was like flames of fire on people's heads. But it didn't burn them. It just looked like flames of fire. So you could imagine. And then something else amazing happened. The, the, you know, just think of it. Just close your eyes for a minute. And think about these people like this big wind, and then there's flames on your head, and Suddenly you're going, whoa, what's going on? But you're not saying it in your language. You're saying it in all kinds of languages. Like we could have French, we could have English, we could have German, Low German, Spanish, everybody. And they were all doing the same thing. They were praising God. They were going like, our God is wonderful, but in all different languages. So I'm wondering how many different languages we have here today. Anybody speak French? German. I know people speak German. Uh, so where's, the, where's our Spanish people, Eric? <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're going to say God is wonderful at the count of three really loud. Okay. Because they were like excited. So one, two, three in your own language. God is wonderful. <laughs> but you know what happened? Then there were people from all over who were followers of God, and they could hear this. They could hear their own language being spoken, and, and they walked by, I guess, the window or wherever the disciples were, and uh, they, they just couldn't believe it. 
And he said, what, what is this? These people, have they been drinking? These sound ridiculous, like all these different, all these different languages. And then Peter spoke up, and you know Peter. Peter sometimes did things not quite what, how we would expect he should do them. He sort of just reacted. Well, he got up, and you know what? I think finally at that moment, things started to make sense, and I think Peter realized, wow, this is a holy moment. And he started talking about Jesus and him dying on the cross and about God and about sending his Holy Spirit to help us while we're on earth. So that is what then Pentecost became when the Christians started to meet together after that. And you know what the Bible says? Guess how many people became believers that day? Who knows? It's a big number. 3,000. So could you imagine, we're sitting with the disciples, the big wind, the fire on our heads, and then suddenly 3,000 people come through that door praising God. Whoa, that's a wild story, right? That's half of Coldell coming through the door for Pentecost. So when you think about Pentecost, think about that was when we had got the gift of the Holy Spirit. And each one of us who are believers in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have that that sense of God within us. And he helps us when we're feeling sad or lonely or have tough situations. So today, when Andrew's speaking, I would like you guys to listen really carefully. And every time you hear the word Pentecost or Spirit or Holy Spirit, I'm giving you some rocket candy. But you can't eat it all. You have to listen. And when you hear those words, then you can eat one candy. And then listen again and see if he says it again. Okay? You get to have, uh, you get to have one of these little candies. You don't have to say anything. You're just listening. And, you're, and, and Andrew, I hope you say those words. <laughs> and when he says something about the spirit, you go, stay. I know that word, and then you eat one candy. Or he goes, today's Pentecost, or Pentecost. Oh, I get to eat another candy. So you have to pay attention. You actually have to pay attention. Oh, now I've really put pressure on him. <laughs> okay, thank you for listening, and thank you mostly for being here. That was wonderful. So we'll call on the worship team now at this time. Good morning. Please uh, stand and join with us and we'll start uh, praising God's name in song. Our first uh, selection will be in the hymnal. It's number 349. It's Spirit of the Living God.
second song is uh, Joys Are Flowing Like a River. If you're following through the hymnal, it's on page 301. And we will sing one, two, three, and five. Thank you for that exuberant singing. And uh, at this time in the worship service, I am going to read some scripture that Andrew will talk about. Um, I hope you're paying attention to the children's story because that was basically based on Acts 2, verses 1 to 13. And now I'm going to read the continuation of that, Acts 2, verses 14 to 24 starting with verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on my people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord 
will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And now we'll have some more singing. Let's stand again and sing number 356, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
Thank you for that singing. Thank you, the worship team, for helping us out with that. I'm going to call on Andrew, Brother Andrew, to come up, and I'll say a quick prayer for him. And at this time, he will deliver the message, Passing the Torch. Dear Lord, we just ask you to be with Andrew this morning. Pour out your spirit upon him. Take any anxiety away. Give him the words that you want him to on him to convey to us. Lord, we ask you to be with the congregation. Help us to concentrate, open our minds and our ears to the message that you would like us to take home today. Be with Brother Andrew, in Jesus' name, amen. Morning, everyone. So, this Sunday is Pentecost. For those of you with candy, you can have your first piece now. (laughs) And Pam, I hope you have extras because I'll be saying those words a lot today. Pentecost is all about the Spirit, Um, so finish chewing before you take those next two, you guys. And if you need more, go go bother Pam, she started this. (laughs) So today, uh, it's one of those weird holidays in the church church calendar that doesn't get a ton of, of attention, I don't think. Um, like like Ascension Day or Epiphany Sunday, um, it's the kind of day that we remember, it shows up in our lectionary, but we don't really anticipate it in the way that we do look forward to other holidays. Um, Personally, for me, this weekend will stand out uh, pretty significantly for a long time, but it doesn't really have that much to do with Pentecost. Uh, I could have shared this during um, sharing, but I thought I'd wait until I came up here anyways. But, uh, so this was probably the most busy weekend of my life. Uh, on Friday, I wrote an exam, um, finishing up my ICU training for, for my work in the hospital as a nurse. Um, so that was quite stressful. And then I had to prepare for this morning, which was also very, very stressful. Um, and then also, uh, because my girlfriend and I are, are both nurses and she's in school and we work shift work and we never see each other very much. Um, yesterday I decided it was the perfect time to ask her to marry me. So <laughs> this has been the busiest weekend I, I've ever had. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, like I said, we're really busy. Unfortunately, she isn't even here today. Uh, <laughs> but her name's Rayanne Bowles. So hopefully some of you have met her and uh, hopefully in the near future, the rest of you can as well. Um, but all that, all that to say, uh, this is, I'll remember this weekend forever, but that has very little to do with Pentecost. Um, so yeah, we, we don't really celebrate Pentecost in the same way that we do celebrate Easter and Christmas. I imagine most of us don't have Pentecost traditions or give gifts or even plan the sort of uh, typical holiday meals or gatherings with family that we do for those other things. We celebrate it in church, we talk about it, The lectionary reminds us when it's coming up. Uh, But I don't think I'm wrong to say that most of us don't really look forward to it. We don't really think about it. But even still, I think that it's it's worth remembering. Um, Hopefully, I don't let the other things from this weekend overshadow Pentecost next year. It's it's a celebration, and and it reminds us of something that's vital to the life of the church. So like, like Pam said, she actually saved me a couple paragraphs here. Pentecost predates the coming of Christ. Um, For the ancient Jews, it was a a kind of harvest festival, like she said, um, where they offered up first fruits and and the harvest to God in celebration of the renewal um, of God's covenant with his people. Um, And Acts 2 is kind of this, in in the same sort of framework, same sort of uh, a mindset. 
um, I think Acts 2 is about renewal and, and passing on the covenant. And so to really, really talk about the, the scripture that Dave just read before we sang, I think we kind of have to talk about all of Acts 2. Um, the whole passage together is the story of Pentecost, and, and the whole passage together is, is, I think, what we can glean the most of when we, when we look at the whole thing. So uh, we'll quickly go over Acts 2, um, 1 to 13-ish. Pam talked about it, so we won't go too far into depth. But I'll just, I'll just read some of the verses here. So Acts 2, verse 2 starts. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout people from every other nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And then we'll jump down to verse 12. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And so in this passage, God descends on the assembly in a mighty rush of wind and in fiery tongues. And this descent allows all those who are present to understand the apostles in their own native tongues. A couple of things I I think are important to point out or, or to note here. The first is that God appearing... Uh, in the form of fire or wind, is nothing new. In Exodus, this happens often. Um, God first appears to Moses in Exodus 3 in the form of a burning bush. When leading the Israelites away from Egypt, uh, away from Pharaoh's army, God uh, appears as a column of fire at night. In Exodus 19, God descends upon Mount Sinai, and the entire mountain is wrapped in smoke because he's descended upon it in fire. Um, And it's not just in Exodus. In Job, uh, God speaks directly to Job out of a whirlwind and a storm. And and there's so many other examples. Um, Obviously, we won't go into them because we're focusing on on Pentecost today. But the point here is that God is fully and truly present in each of these scenarios. These aren't omens. They aren't hints. Um, God doesn't send the whirlwind to Job as like a messenger. It's God who's very present and very there in each of these scenarios. And I think in the same way, in Acts 2, we're told that God descends. The Holy Spirit is God, fire and wind in this setting again. And I think that that's essential to our understanding of Pentecost. In Jesus, God has sent his son to guide us, sent his son to earth to tangibly and physically show us the way. And at Pentecost, after Jesus has gone back, God sends the Spirit. And I think the the important thing here um, is that God is here and present and available to us just as much as Jesus was for the disciples, though obviously in in a different way. Uh, But I think this is is vital to understanding Acts as a whole. The second point that we can point out uh, is that this miracle of uh, of universal understanding um, is often thought to connect us or get us to look back to the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, where God um, sees humans coming together and working together in pride uh, and somewhat in defiance of what God wants and decides that he needs to confound our our language and change the way that we understand one another to kind of separate us, to make us humble. We won't go too deep into that story either, um, but the comparison is important. In this story of the Tower of Babel, God takes something from humanity that we had present uh, when we were in the garden with Adam and Eve. It, this is part of the loss that we have from the fall of sin, or fall into sin. But here, in, in Acts 2, um, God gifts us back that mutual and universal understanding. So God's covenant with God's people to bring salvation ha- has begun. We've started to, to come closer, come back towards where God had us at, at the beginning, before sin came into our lives. Already in Acts, this early, that's begun. With this gift of understanding, God is showing us that the early church is continuing the original covenant, um, just as they celebrated at Pentecost before the coming of Christ, and that the church is the next step in God's salvation plan. 
with the gift of the Spirit, God is fully here to continue to guide us in that work. And so that brings us to the next, uh, next part of this passage in Acts 2 that, uh, that Dave read. Um, and it makes us kind of ask the question, what's our role in all of this? So we'll just paraphrase some of that, but 14 to 22-ish uh, says this. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jer- Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. One of the things that that jumps out at me in this passage is that there's very, very few people who escape God's notice. We can start with male and female servants. Well, not all of us are servants, um, so maybe we might, might escape notice here. But then Peter goes on and he mentions the young and the old. But some of us are middle-aged. Maybe we can squeeze by. But then beyond the young and the old, he, he mentions that uh, it'll be your sons and daughters. Some of us might not think of ourselves as sons and daughters. We might not really identify as children anymore. Um, so I, I guess we could get by on that, but that's a tough one because everyone comes from somewhere. <laughs> but then la- or I get at the beginning... The passage says that God has poured out his spirit on all flesh, everyone. And I think this is why verse 17 jumps out at me so much. Servants will prophesy, young people will see visions, old people will dream dreams. It's everyone who's involved here. It really shows us that all of us have a job to do. And at first glance, I think that these these are sort of future-oriented tasks, visions and prophecy and dreams. We don't think that those are things for the here and now. But I think that's something we should reconsider. We often think of, uh, of prophecy, visions, dreams as, as future predictions. They aren't focused on the here and now. But prophecy isn't just what we normally think of. It's not just foretelling or predicting. That's part of it. But most of the prophets that we see in the Old Testament, they weren't just there to give predictions about the future. Their job was to be a warning to God's people to turn back to God. Their predictions served to convince people to return to God's covenant. They criticized the kings of Israel and Judah. They criticized the wealthy, the oppressors, the people that turned away from God. Um, They were sort of Israel and Judah's moral compass. They condemned social injustice, poverty, selfishness, idolatry, uh, pretty much everything that the Israelites were doing wrong. And so their visions weren't just visions for the sake of visions. They They were purposeful and that they helped make the community closer to what God wanted. So whether their prophets predicted doom or joy, they always counseled the people to come to God. Visions and dreams, too, I think, aren't just about premonition. They aren't just foretelling events. Uh, the story of Joseph, Joseph sorry, is, a, is a good example of this. In Genesis 37, Joseph has dreams that are only predictions of the future. He doesn't really know what to do with them. But later on in that story, when, when, Pharaoh, or when Pharaoh calls for Joseph to interpret his dreams, God doesn't just tell Joseph what it means. He, he tells Joseph how to, fo- how to solve the problem. And so I think we can take this and say that dreams aren't just about seeing our future, but about finding ways to act now that make that future closer to what God wants for us. Dreams and visions are about finding ways for us to be more faithful to God, about building a better church in the present, about building God's kingdom. Like prophecy, they aren't just simply things to warn us or give us insight about the future, but they're also meant to help us change now so that we can make that future better. So in Acts 2, in this part of the, uh, of the, of the story, God descends upon all flesh. Servants aren't valued because of who they serve, but because they can bring those people closer to God. The young aren't valued just because of their visions of the future, but because of their participation in the church in the here and now. Likewise, the elderly aren't important because of what they've done in the past, but because of the dreams they can bring to the table now. 
The church is all of us, all participating in the here and now, and we all play important parts and need to continue and perpetually do so. And so the final part of Acts 2 is kind of Peter's sermon and the result of this whole um, event. So 33, and I think I kind of stop at 41 here, 43. So being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ, this man whom you've crucified. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls, or the Lord our God calls to himself. So those who received his word were baptized, and there, and there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And so this, this little passage is the final part of Peter's sermon uh, in Acts 2, and it kind of tells us the end result of all of the events at Pentecost. Here Peter makes it clear that Christ is still alive, that the outpouring of the Spirit is the continuation of the kingdom that Jesus was setting up while he was on earth. And Peter spends most of his sermon kind of describing how Jesus is the one that David predicted would come to bring about God's salvation, the long-awaited Messiah. Peter argues here that everything the people are seeing, this miracle of speech and understanding, uh, the other signs that they mention, these are all direct, the direct result of Jesus' divinity and Christhood. It's widely believed that the author of Luke is also the author of Acts. That means that we can kind of think of Acts as the sort of second half of the same book. The first being the story of Jesus spreading his kingdom, and Acts is the second half of that, where the church spreads God's kingdom throughout the Roman world or or the ancient world after receiving the Spirit of God in each and every one of them. So not only does this miracle of Pentecost show us the next step in God's plan for salvation, as we saw earlier, but here Peter is showing us that it's building upon the foundations that Jesus himself laid. It's because of Jesus and his divinity, his messiahship, his work on earth, that all of these miracles and signs are happening. And having Jesus with us is is integral to the process and to the working of this kingdom. Peter makes it clear that that's the most important thing that he's talking about. The results of, of all of this, the results of Pentecost, are the formation of the early church. 3,000 believers in one day. Like Pam said, that's half of Coaldale from from one little meeting in a house. The culmination of this whole formula is the creation of the church. Um, A little side bit. Uh, Augustine, one of the early influential theologians of the early church, he called Pentecost Dies Natalis. Um, Dies being the Latin word for day, and natal, some of you might recognize that word, it's the the root in the medical world for newborn infants. And so St. Augustine here is calling this uh, the birthday of the church. And I think that this, this is really what we're celebrating at Pentecost. So the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is the continuation and renewal of God's work. It's the descent of God's full presence in the Spirit, where we get access to God just as substantially as the disciples had with Jesus. It's the next step in God's work to save the world. It's the continuation of the Old Testament covenant and Jesus' work on earth. And it's also a calling to each of us, I think, to participate in that work of salvation. And finally, Pentecost and Peter's sermon give us proof that we need the Spirit if we're going to be faithful. After Jesus' death, his followers are in disarray, they're disorganized, they're hiding in fear of the authorities and their association with Jesus. But then he comes back from the dead, and he returns to the Father, but he doesn't leave us alone again. This time he gives us a parting gift. With the Spirit, we have the result of the birth of the church. And so Acts is this transition from Jesus' ministry while he was walking through Galilee and Judea, Uh, to the spread of the early church through the gift of his continued presence throughout the world. It's essentially the story of salvation spread through what was then the the Roman world, first with Peter and then Paul. And this all starts with Pentecost.
And so throughout this sequel to the Gospels, uh, that, we, that is Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit is the primary creditor for this eruption of faithful followers. And what that tells me is that if we're to be faithful, if we're to participate in God's work of salvation, then the first step, like in Acts, the first step is to have the Holy Spirit come down into us. Into us, sorry. So Jesus was the first part. Jesus was the connector from God's work in the Old, Old Testament, um, bringing God's kingdom to fruition as he walked and talked and preached throughout Galilee and Jerusalem. But then Jesus returns to the Father and leaves that work of building God's kingdom with us. But he also leaves his spirit. So he passes the torch on to us, I think, for us to continue his work after he's returned. And that part, that part is important that he leaves his spirit with us. Because the spirit is the source for success in God's kingdom. That's clear throughout Acts. Um, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 60 times, give or take a few, uh, in the book of Acts. And it's almost always credited with being the source of the disciples and, and apostles' success. And so Jesus, before sending the, seer, the spirit, has done all of the work. But now he sent it here for us to take part in it. It's our turn to do something and participate in his kingdom. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we do that? How do we go about that? How do we let God's spirit call us and move us into faithfulness? And I confess that for me, this is something that I struggle with. Rather than spirituality, I like logic. I like research. I like making arguments. My favorite part of preparing for sermons isn't contemplation or prayer, uh, though I do try to emphasize that. I love the research and the reading, the forming arguments and putting things onto paper. I, I work hard and I, I want to find faithfulness, faithfulness by working at it or thinking about it. My mind prefers to understand and come to its own conclusions and decisions. And I think to some extent this is just the way that human brains work. Some of us like to analyze, others like to feel, others have some sort of hybrid mix of both. Um, but for all of us, I think, our brains have routines and patterns that we prefer over outside influences. And to some extent, I think that those patterns are good things. They make us different. They make us unique. Um, they're, God made all of us, and they're, they're gifts from God, and, and our personalities are important. God makes use of those things. But I think if we try to get there by ourselves, if we try to, to use our own brains, our own, our own way, We'll get pieces of it. We can get bits and pieces of God's kingdom right, but it won't be enough. We simply aren't able on our own. And the story of Acts, the whole book, in essence, makes that clear to us. Throughout its stories, we see that the only way to be faithful, to participate in God's work, to build God's kingdom, is to let the Spirit guide us. God has to come first, and then faithfulness follows. Old dreamers, young visionaries, prophesying servants, sons and daughters, all people, everyone who accepts God's call, we're all given the gift of Christ's presence to guide us as we are witnesses for his kingdom. And that witness is the point of his presence. It's to live like God's kingdom is already here among us in fruition and to live faithfully and build God's church. And so we need to find ways to let God kind of take over, to let God influence us more than we let ourselves, right? And this is, isn't something that we can just do once and forget about. Christian community, God's word and the Bible, prayer, these are all starting points where we can tune our ears to hear or help our eyes see what our roles are meant to be in God's kingdom. And that'll likely be different for all of us. But these are ways that we can seek to learn to let God be first in our hearts, in our lives, and in our decisions. But like I said, it's not something that we can just do once and forget about. The young can't wait for maturity. They have their visions now. The old can't wait or, or relax because of the faithful things they've done in the past. Their dreams still change the way that we ought to be. It's a present calling for all of us all the time. It's work that never ends on this side of heaven. But at the same time, it isn't work. Like I said before, if we work on our own, we won't get there. We don't do it ourselves. We don't do it alone. That's the whole point of the Spirit. We have God alongside us just as much as the disciples had in Jesus. And so to, to conclude, 
Pentecost, in essence, is the birth of the church. It's the passing of the torch onto us to become part of God's salvation, to become part of his work. And I think that that's worth celebrating and participating in, or, or sorry, anticipating. It's a continuing call to embrace Christ's presence to allow us to live as faithful witnesses. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, ancient Greek translation, sorry, the same word is used to describe the breath of life that's given to Adam and Eve as is used to describe the Spirit. The only difference is that it adds the prefix of holiness. So we could call the Spirit the holy breath. And I think that that's really true. It's God giving us life. A life in Christ, a life in God's kingdom. With the Holy Spirit, we have God fill us and sustain us and work through us and for us. We don't need to find that faithfulness on our own. We can breathe it in and let our lungs do the work. We need to let God in and change us and lead us into faithfulness. And so, in essence, I think Pentecost teaches us that all we need to do is let the Spirit in and find ways to keep letting it in. In doing so, we let God mold us and lead us into faithfulness, continually building his church just as the apostles did at Pentecost. And so I hope and pray that all of us can find those ways to do that, to let, to let the Spirit guide us and let the Spirit change us and mold us and make us more faithful as we serve God. Amen. Please join us in singing, Great Are You, Lord. Stand as well.
Could you join me in the benediction, number 762, in your hymnals? Come, Holy Spirit. Come as holy fire and burn in us. Come as holy wind and cleanse us within. Come as holy light and lead us in our darkness. Come as holy truth and dispel our ignorance. Come as holy life and dwell in us. Come as holy life and dwell in us. Send us, abide with us, use us, that the Father may be glorified and our joy be made full. Amen. Go in peace and let the Holy Spirit work in your life this week.